convening of our committee. I'm joined by my left, uh, Council Member Howard Shook, who's also vice chair, and to his left, Council Member Jason Winston. We are one shy of a quorum. Uh, we will do the official call to order as well as the minutes once everyone arrives. Um, but with that, I think we can still go ahead and proceed and move on to public comment as well as the presentations. And then by then, hopefully, um, we'll have a, a fourth person with us. Um, so, all right. Uh, so with that, uh, we'll just skip item C and D for now and move specifically through to public comment. Uh, we do have one person signed up, Desiree Thomas. Ms. Thomas, if you'll come to the podium as you're doing that, just a reminder that you have three minutes. You'll see a clock uh, behind us ticking backwards. Actually, we have, actually, if you hold on just a second, we now have Councilmember Hillis. With that, we constitute a quorum, uh, so I'll officially call this meeting to order. There's a motion from Shook to adopt the agenda. Is there a second from Winston? Um, if you can, let's open that vote, please, and then we'll take a verbal vote from Councilmember Hillis as he gets signed in. The vote is open. Aye. Aye. The vote's closed. Four yeas, zero nays. The motion carries. The agenda is adopted. Next item is approval of the minutes. There's a motion from Shook, Second. seconded by Hillis. Let's open that vote, please. The vote is open. The vote's closed. Four yeas, zero nays. Motion carries. Minutes are approved. Thank you for your patience that while we got those business items out. Uh, you have the floor again. Three minutes. You'll see a clock ticking backwards behind me. And as it approaches zero, I'll ask you to uh, wind your comments down. Thank, Thank you. you. Hey, y'all. My name is Desiree Thomas. I work at the Amplify Georgia Collaborative, which is a reproductive justice organization based here in Atlanta. Councilman Hillis, you're actually my council person, so it's good to see you here today. Um, I am here because uh, last week, Councilmember Bakhtiari introduced a resolution for abortion funding um, to allocate $300,000 to ARC Southeast to further their mission of helping people afford abortions. Um, so I just wanted to thank y'all for doing that. Thank all of y'all for signing on. I heard the only reason you didn't sign on, Councilman uh, Shook, is because you weren't there. Um, so thank you for all of y'all <laughs> signing on to that um, and voting. Uh, in support of abortion funding. I think it's really important to do that. Over the last year with the Dobbs decision, um, abortion has become much harder to access and with Georgia's HB 481 in place, we have an early abortion ban which starts around six weeks. And so after that, uh, people cannot access abortion care in Georgia. But the thing about that is most people don't even know they're pregnant at that point. Um, and so it's very difficult for people to get an abortion when they don't even know that they're pregnant. And so ARC Southeast um, helps people get that care by providing them with funding for travel, for lodging, um, for child care and things like that so they can get to their appointments. And with, again, the Dobbs decision being in place and our six-week ban being in place, people are having to try their further for abortion care um, and that costs more money. And there'll be later in their pregnancies when that happened. Um, and so I just wanted to say thank y'all for allocating that funding. Um, I'm hoping that you can continue to do that because in Georgia it doesn't seem like our state government um, is going to stop the attacks on abortion anytime soon. So it's fantastic to see cities um, doing that work. Um, and I know also in the resolution, it says that you're gonna send it to all these other counties to uh, ask them to do the same. And thank you, because now I can email those folks and I can say, hey, I heard you got a resolution from the Atlanta City Council. I would love to talk to you about that. So thank y'all for opening that door for me. Um, I'm hoping that if we continue this, that hopefully we can expand that funding because the more that ART can get, um, the more people can get the care that they need. And so, again, I appreciate that, and I hope to continue to work with y'all to figure out how we can get that expanded for next year. Thank you, Thank so much. Yeah, I was actually going to encourage you to reach out to the other municipalities as well, because that's what we're going to try and do. Tell all of them that they should be expecting yeah. an email from me, like, <laughs> next week. Every county on there should be on notice. I hope they're watching. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Thank you. And I believe that concludes our public comment for the day. Uh, with that, we're going to go ahead and move, keep moving through the agenda. We have presentations next. First up is Open Records Compliance Act update. There. Ms. Denius, good to see you again. Good afternoon, everyone. It's good, good to see you, too. I have a very brief update, which I'm sure will not be um, uh, unwelcome news. Uh, okay, we'll see. So the first thing I want to do is remind everybody where they can go to get to my transparency webpage because I have a lot of really good resources on there, FAQs, links to documents and policies and protocols that we use at the city. It is not the easiest thing to find, but if you go, if you click on that part that I have circled here on the city's main webpage, there is a drop down menu and one of the things in the drop down menu is request open records and that takes you to my transparency page. So that's just public service announcement. 
The second thing is just some very brief updates. Um, unfortunately, I am still working on the implementation of the open records management software. Um, as you all probably know, we have a somewhat complicated IT landscape at the city with um, different, there's a couple of departments specifically aviation that's on a completely different server and a completely different VPN. And so in order to hook the software into everything and make sure and, in, that, and test it and make sure it's working properly across all of the platforms, we don't want to start using it and create expectations that we cannot um, actually fulfill. So hopefully all of that will be, um, isn't, it should be ironed out now, we're still, we're in the process of retesting, making sure that everybody has access before we turn folks loose internally to get practice on the software before we think about opening up a portal to the public. So all of that is expected to happen during the summer with the hope that our open records public facing portal will be available in the fall. Um, I don't want to jinx myself. I'm just going to say we're hoping at this point. Um, but everything does work. The, the, my experience in the software is that I think it's going to be a great thing. So. Um, if you have any questions about that, I can try to answer them. Um, the last thing that I wanted to talk about today is just more for informational purposes because it's something that we do a lot um, and we get a lot of requests for emails. So that's the new thing. Um, obviously during the pandemic, everybody, even the, even the late adopters were kicked into the current state of technology and we use emails to transmit um, documents and messages and communications far more far and away more than any other type of record at the city and so we do get a lot of requests for email records and so I wanted to explain to our internal folks and also anyone who may be watching uh, what our protocol is for retrieving emails because we do have one for a lot of reasons and this is hard to see <laughs> on this slide it looked better on my computer um, but we have a, a, the email search and retrieval protocol is one of the documents that is linked on the transparency webpage. It is very detailed and very long and also one of the things that I suspect is an excellent resource if you are suffering from insomnia. But what I will do is go through it very quickly just so that everyone has a flavor of how we do this. So what we do not do at the city is ask individual employees to retrieve their own email records. That is problematic for a variety of reasons. One, no one will ever believe you that you did not delete the email that they were looking for. Um, two, people manage their inboxes in various ways. And so, but everything is always saved on the server. And so from a, stamp, from a legal standpoint of being able to go to court if necessary and testify that we have conducted the most thorough reasonable search we can, the best way to do that is by searching the email server. And so we have a system set up where there's a contact person in AIM who is the point person for all internal email server search requests. And um, so if we need to do that, we send him the search parameters, currently it's a him, um, and then he provides those parameters to our email server vendor who runs the search and re retrieves, first what they do is they retrieve a hit count. So that is the number of times the search parameters hit within the data that's being searched. So for within a certain time frame, if there were certain keywords in particular email accounts, it'll come, they'll come back and say, okay, well, there are this many hits on your search parameters. And we use that hit count as an estimate of volume in order to be able to turn around within the three business days that the law allows to provide a requester with an approximate estimate of how much it will cost and how long it will take to provide access to those emails. Um, that's very important because in the email realm, we have a lot of emails. We have, you know, eight to 9,000 employees. All of them have email accounts. If I send an email to, every, to all of you on this panel right now, if when we pull that out, that's seven emails. So group messages cl can clog up the works. Just FYI, don't do hit the reply all button. I don't know how many of you have been getting the reply all button emails over the last day from the pension thing. Oh my God. All I can think of is I'm going to get a request for this and I have to go through 600,000 emails. Um, but so we get the hit count, we provide that, that cost estimate. People do not typically realize the volume that they are dealing with when they request email records from us because we generate a lot of emails. And so if it's less than $25, typically we will provide that for free because that is a very small amount. Um, over $25, people have to indicate their willingness to accept the costs. 
and over $500, they have to prepay us before we will start collecting anything. And that is actually not hard to do in an open records context. I just pr um, provided an, a cost estimate to a requester uh, day before yesterday. The, the hit count was 46,000 emails, and the cost estimate was in the $7,000 range. So what happens in that scenario is we are still obligated to provide the records, but they are obligated to pay us first. So if they want to do that, we will then pro start processing the records request. Typically what actually happens is they're like, oh, okay, sorry, didn't really want all that. This is what I really want. And we work with the requester to try to get the cost estimate into kind of a reasonable range. Um, because and sometimes people are trying to make giant requests. Um, and, but if they, so if they want to pay, then, then we will provide them those records. Um, the other thing that you all should know, and I want everybody to know, is that obviously when we do email server searches, um, depending on the request, it is, it's likely or sometimes likely that members of the law department will be included in those emails. Now that presents a problem from a privilege standpoint. Um, obviously attorney-client privilege still applies in emails. So the way we handle that is the server team has a list of all of the attorneys in the law department for the last, I think it's like 10 years because privilege doesn't expire when the attorney leaves. Um, and so they run that list of lawyers across the email results when they pull a search. And they pull it out in two different buckets. One bucket is all of the emails that don't have a lawyer involved, and that goes to the department that requested the emails so that they can review them for other exemptions. Things, you know, processes that are still open, open criminal investigations, personnel investigations, personal information, things that are always exempt. That's done in the department. The other bucket that has a, a lawyer in the thread goes to the law department, and they review them only for privilege, and then they turn over whatever is not privileged back to the department for the rest of the exemption review. So that's how we handle that um, so that we can preserve the, the privilege. Um, and then once we provide a cost estimate to the requester, again, there's sometimes a negotiation piece where we try to come uh, to a, a better set of search parameters to achieve everybody's goal. So I thought it would be interesting for you all to understand how that works, um, just in case you have constituents who are curious about submitting a, or a search for emails. I'm always happy to help anyone um, figure out how best to craft their search so that they are able to get what they want um, instead of you know floods and floods of un, uh, an interesting or irrelevant information. Um, one thing that I do tell people all the time is there's no need to start big and whittle your way down to what you actually want. You don't only have one bite at this apple. Sometimes it's better to kind of set yourself a trail of breadcrumbs, right? So you start small, you see what comes back, maybe that suggests some search terms to you for your next search, which we're always happy to do. So. That is all I have for now. If anyone has any questions, I would be happy to answer them. All right, before I take questions, I want to acknowledge that we've been joined by council members Matt Westmoreland, Liliana Bakhtiari, and Marcy Collier Overstreet. Um, questions? I do have a quick question about when you said um, the attorney privilege piece, does that also extend to outside counsel, even if they don't copy an internal law department employee on them? So you're talking about an email from outside counsel retained by the law department to an employee. No, I'm saying we, we employ all, all sorts of outside counsel on a, mir a myriad of different cases that are consulting the city. And yes. sometimes it's a, on a matter that involves a council member and they may, that outside counsel may be communicating directly with us. By extension of the fact that they're counsel for the city, does that mean that information is privileged even when a city of law department um, city law department staff isn't copied on it. Yeah, as long as the outside counsel is retained by the city law department, then the communications with that outside counsel would also be privileged. So that's part of your filter as well. You mentioned there's a filter that tags any law department employee to say those get sifted out for further review. Does that also apply to outside counsel? I think Ms. Robinson would like to answer that. Hi, Amber A. Robinson, City of Atlanta Department of Law. It is always privileged. If, if the city attorney has, uh, has re, uh, engaged outside counsel, those communications are privileged. However, to the point about the filter, um, the filter will not catch that. We then have to catch that manually unless the outside counsel 
or the client representative um, copies a law department representative on the communication. We do internally encourage and request that outside counsel always uh, copy a member of the Department of Law on any such communications for various reasons, but that being chief among them. But if that is not the case, we would ask if you're aware of that and you're looped into any such communications that you go ahead and uh, copy a member of the Department of Law, either the person you've been working with or the city attorney, or if you're council members, you can copy myself to, to help with that. But we do catch that, we can catch it manually, but for it to be automated, one of the members of the Department of Law must be must be copied. All right, I just think, because council member Bakhtiari and I were just copied on um, a, a, an email with outside counsel, I believe, on an annexation matter. And so I just, that was why I asked the question. So. Yeah, so anytime you, to, to Ms. Robinson's point, if you just copy someone from the law department, yeah. that will that will flag the whole thread. Other questions? Council Member Bakhtiari. So we should hit reply all on Please every email? Please don't ever reply, hit reply. Don't <laughs> anyone ever hit reply all. I actually asked someone from AIM if it was possible to disable that button. Like citywide. We'll ask again at the next presentation. <laughs> <laughs> because it's never a good idea. I mean, from an open record standpoint, especially, but I will tell you that the number of people on a group email, each additional person exponentially increases the likelihood that that email will go to somebody that the person who's sending the message did not intend to send it to. Like almost half of the oops type emails that I've uncovered reviewing emails is from a group message. So expand the group so that you know who you're rep responding to or don't hit reply all. Other questions for um, Ms. Danius? Seeing none, thank you, appreciate it. Um, and you might take advantage of if, you, if they're not being helpful enough. AIM is here, they can help resolve your view. Oh, they're very helpful, we just always have an issue. All right, with that we'll move on to our, our uh, Atlanta Information Management Quarterly Update. Commissioner Sankey, if you will approach the podium, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, Chair Juan, members of the Finance Executive Committee. I am Jason Sankey, Chief Information Officer for the City, overseeing Atlanta Information Management, better known as AIM. And we, when we talk about reply all, uh, we can start there. That, that's a very tricky scenario. We have some best practices. We say, if you have a distribution group put into BCC, that way if somebody replies all, you won't get it. Uh, but if we disable it, we disable it altogether. So there is no replying to emails anymore. So you have to think through that. Um, you heard from me not too long ago at the budget presentation. So I will try to limit the redundancy of today's presentation, uh, as well as highlight some areas of interest to council. So in order to support the mayor's vision, I've shared our vision, mission, and core values previously. But I would like to draw your attention to our four focus areas. We have customer experience, employee growth, reliability of services, and securing our environment. Everything we do within AIM is centered around these four key areas. You heard about the mayor's pit, uh, four pillars of one safe city, a city of opportunity for all, a city built for the future, and a effective and ethical government. And as I look through the pillars and think about the city holistically, most of the things that we do have a technology component as we drive the city forward. Moving on to our personnel report, uh, our salary for fiscal year 2023 was approximately $8.5 million. As of May 31st, we are forecasting an overage of around $200,000. As I mentioned in the last FEC, as well as in our budget presentation, we were requesting 20 FTEs. Uh, we did receive five, uh, and we're gonna reduce our con contracted staff by 20% as a result. Uh, and we will continue to reduce throughout the course of the fiscal year. As I mentioned in the budget presentation, I'd like to focus on relying on data to drive our staffing strategy. This dashboard represents both our personnel and non-personnel operating budget, uh, our forecast, and our cumulative spend thus far. 
As of May 31st, our consumption was just shy of 96%. We do expect to exceed our budget allocation for FY23. Wanted to go over a few project updates and I, I have reported on this before, so I'm just gonna point out a couple of things. So ethical and effective government, as mentioned pre previously, we're laser focused on ways to save money. And the one thing I wanna point out at, on this slide is that our last FEC meeting uh, that we presented, we identified a total savings of $2.7 million. That number is now up to 2.9. So we're continuing to uh, sharpen our pencils and figure out ways we can save money. One Safe City, AIM implemented the new password policy in January that I spoke about, and we now have 86% of our users compliant with that policy. So we've made a lot of ground since our last update. And then a city built for the future, I wanted to share some data regarding uh, our customer facing 311 entry points. Uh, we receive approximately 15,000 interactions per week. 77% of survey responses received a three star or better rating on a scale of one to five. And we have actively reviewed unsatisfactory responses and in some cases implemented enhancements to address those low ratings. Uh, we also have 10 additional enhancements currently in development. And I'm sure Council Member Hillis uh, you, you will ask about those later, but we talked about those in our last briefing and they are in development right now. A city for opportunity for all. I want to point out uh, we are now up to 24 interactive kiosks throughout the city. Another 57 are in flight and three of those are actively under construction right now. We have also realized uh, confirmed revenue of $158,000. And this includes the guaranteed revenue to the city of $10,000 per kiosk per year, as well as an additional 50% of revenue share from advertising. And some data points uh, that were requested. So during the first nine months, which represents 11 kiosks, we had an average of uh, 3,000 visits to a kiosk per month. Uh, as someone visited the kiosk, there were four apps that were open, and the average weekly viewer is estimated at two million, and this represents both foot and vehicle traffic. Also wanted to share a few highlights. Uh, we recently closed two projects and in-flight projects that directly impact uh, districts. We have a safe and secure housing initiative, uh, APD camera refresh and expansion, uh, Wi-Fi installation at various rec centers, uh, APD software development that will provide centralized access and analysis of data, and in partnership with DPR, a pilot to include eSport opportunities for youth at one of our rec centers. Some performance highlights. We have five legislation's upcoming, and we have seven competitive bids that are currently in flight. And in FY23, we legislated a total of 32 legislations. Performance metrics, the average time to complete a ticket has decreased compared to our last calendar year, uh, which is a positive data point to report. We have also seen a decrease in the number of incidents that have been submitted to AIM, about 5,000. And over the past two months, we've exceeded our target SLAs. Moving to the next slide, from an outage perspective, we've experienced uh, sporadic Wi-Fi outage in March. I'm not sure if it impacted anyone in this room, but it did expand over a 14-day period and that in conjunction with the Microsoft, Microsoft outage in January, it um, actually also spanned over a week and it drastically increased the business that impact numbers. Uh, you see there uh, about 650 uh, hours of business impact because of those two outages this year. 
Moving on to our project data, we have a total of 131 projects that are currently in flight. Uh, four of those are in a caution status. Uh, we have opened a total of 38 new projects uh, thus far this year. Uh, and with that, I want to thank you for your time and I look forward to answering any questions you may have. All right, questions for the CIO. Um, I have a couple of them. Um, I'll just jump in then. Um, on the Ike um, facilities, the smart kiosks, um, I, I, I think I'm asked in transport or in, yeah, in transportation um, about usage statistics. I don't know if, if you all house those and have them. I'm just very curious to see, particularly in, in different spots that they're located, how people are using them. If it is for uh, navigation and wayfinding, how many people are connecting to the Wi-Fi ca capacity, um, and uh, you know if there are other uses that, that we're not aware of. Because I do think that's going to be helpful. Um, as we continue to explore places in our districts to put them, or quite frankly, not to put them, because of that, uh, those, that, those data points. We do keep those data points. Uh, it, it may make sense for us to follow up after this just to get a list of what data points you want to actually look at, and we can definitely get those to you. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I would appreciate that. Just because um, you know, there's been kind of mixed feedback from the district, uh, my constituents. Um, but I think those numbers would help us continue building the case of why, um, who is using them and how they're being used. Yep. Okay. And then my other question is on your cost savings, which uh, that number 2.9 million is pretty impressive. Are those, do you kind of calculate those on, on um, all enterprise wide deployments that you do in terms of technology or technology purchases? This is uh, general fund only. Okay. Uh, we do have additional savings with aviation as well as watershed that aren't included in these numbers. Would you say those, uh, those enterprise funds, watershed or air, airport, are on the same level or are they higher or lower? I, I will say that they're a little lower, okay. but we've identified for this upcoming year much higher savings on, on both sides. I, I think that's an important value add that y'all can bring, particularly as everything keep, continues to get more and more automated, um, both from our side operationally as well as our interface with the public. Um, you know, that, that seems to be the way to you know, increase productivity and output and throughput as well as um, cost savings as you start, you continue to look and work with procurement in terms of um, citywide, not just enterprise-wide, but citywide um, application deployment. So, okay. Other questions um, for the CIO while he's here? All right. If not, thank you for your presentation. Thank you. All right. With that, we'll go ahead and move into our legislative agenda. First item up is the consent agenda. Uh, we have one ordinance first read. I'll ask Ms. Linda to read that in. Yes, Mr. Chair. That item is 230-1339. This is an ordinance by Finance Executive Committee amending resolution 20R 3230 to correct the name of the vendor for contract number listed herein to Prudential Retirement Insurance and Annuity Company to recognize the, the change of control and name change of the vendor to Empower Annuity Insurance Company of America to authorize payments to Empower under the agreements to ratify payments made and services received pursuant to the agreement on and from April 1st, 2022 to authorize the mayor or his chief financial officer as his designee to sign any necessary documents and for other purposes. All right, with that, we'll accept that and uh, address that next cycle. And then it takes us to ordinances for second read. First item up is 23-01311, an ordinance by Finance Executive Committee authorizing the chief financial officer to record any necessary adjustments to ensure the proper close out of fiscal year 2023 general fund, each special revenue fund, each debt service fund, and each capital projects fund budgets, and to comply with the official code of Georgia section listed whereby each unit of a local government shall adopt and operate under an annual balanced budget for the general fund, each special revenue fund, and each debt service fund in use by the local government, and to comply with the official code of Georgia, whereby departmental expenditures may not legally exceed budget and for other purposes. Ms. Carr, you have the floor. Good afternoon, Yolanda Carr, Deputy CFO. This is really, again, an accounting um, legislation we're closing out our fiscal year which is on friday june 30th so really this has given us an opportunity to make sure we make the proper adjustments before we move into our year and close out any questions motion from westmoreland to approve Second. seconded by shook let's open the vote please 
like the vote is open. Will everyone please, the vote is closed. Six J zero nays, motion carries, item is approved. Next item, 2301312, an ordinance by finance executive committee authorizing the mayor or his designee to execute special procurement agreement number listed. GASB 75 with the Siegel Company, Southeast Inc., on behalf of the Department of Finance, pursuant to Section 2-1191.1 of the City of Atlanta Code of Ordinances for a term of three years retroactively effective May 1st, 2023, with two one-year renewal options in an amount not to exceed $126,000.00 to ratify services rendered in connection with the agreement beginning May 1st, 2023. All contractor work to be charged to and paid from fund department organization and account numbers listed herein and for other purposes. Ms. Carr. Again, Yolanda Carr, Deputy CFO. Um, with this legislation, this is Siegel working with the city to make sure that we have the proper accounting for GASB 75, which is really just a fancy name for our um, medical retirees. And so we're just trying to make sure that we gather the information. Um, this is a three-year contract, um, two years with one-year renewal option. And so we're moving forward to make sure we have the entry and everything with the accounting for year and close out. So most from Shook to approve, seconded by Westmoreland. Why the retroactive to May 1st? So the work has already started, and so we just wanted to make sure that we were proactive and included that in the legislation because June 30th again is on Friday, so we've started the work. There's a motion that's been properly seconded. Let's open the vote, please. The vote is open. The vote's closed. Six yeas, zero nays. Motion carries. The item is approved. Uh, Thank next you. Item 2301319, an ordinance by Finance Executive Committee authorizing the mayor or his designee on behalf of the City of Atlanta to grant a permanent easement over a portion of city owned property consisting of approximately 191.27 square feet of land, more or less, located at the intersection of Northside Drive, Southwest, and Greens Ferry Avenue, south Southwest, and land lot 84, the 14th District, Fulton County, Georgia, tax parcel identification number listed with an address of 565 Greens Ferry Avenue, Southwest Atlanta, Georgia, 30314, to the Georgia Department of Transportation for the installation and maintenance of a new traffic signal as part of their traffic signal improvement projects, waiving any conflicting provisions of Article 10, Division 14, Subsection 3 of the Atlanta City Code, and for other purposes. Commissioner Santil. Greetings, Chair and members of the committee. Remy Santil, Commissioner of uh, Department of Enterprise Asset Management. The purpose of this legislation is as read. The Department of Enterprise Asset Management has reviewed the plans and recommends granting a permanent easement to allow GDOT to install and maintain traffic signals for the improvement of the traffic signaling and at the intersection of Northside Drive and Greens Ferry Avenue. All right, questions for the commissioner. Motion from Shook, Second. seconded by Hillis. Let's open that vote, please. The vote is open. The vote's closed. Five yeas, zero nays. Motion carries. This item is approved. Next item, in 2301328, there is a substitute that changes the caption. I'll read it in and then make the motion. It's an ordinance by council members Bond, Winston, Amos, Dozier, Bakhtiari, Juan, Norwood, Hillis, Boone, Collier Overstreet, Lewis, and Westmoreland, as substituted by Finance Executive Committee to establish a retention incentive payment program for fiscal year 24 to apply to E911 employees to amend the fiscal year 2024 emergency telephone system fund E911 budget by transferring an amount not to exceed $420,000.00 to accounts identified by the chief financial officer and for other purposes. I'll move to bring the Second. substitute forward, seconded by Shook. Let's open the vote, please. The vote is open. The vote's closed. Five yeas, zero nays. Motion carries. And just uh, the substitute uh, adds the amount of $400,000 and changes the incentive payment to $2,500. So, uh, Commissioner Smith, I, did I? Commissioner Smith might be out oh, today, CFO, but I'll. CFO Ball is going to speak to this. To CFO, you have the floor. <clears throat> yes. Um, so, it's uh, coordination with the uh, Mayor's office, as well as, well as human resources, um, there were two recommendations for the utilization of fund balance to um, incentivize employees grades 19 and below to stay with the city. So these retention bonuses. Uh, this specific one here is for um, the E911 operators um, and to allow them uh, to uh, receive this retention bonus to commit to staying to the, with the city for a period of one year. 
All right, questions. Council Member Hillis, and there's a motion from Shook to approve on substitute. Let me go ahead and get a, a seconded by Hillis. Mr. Hillis, you have the floor. Thank you, Chairman Wan. Um, the ETS fund, that's the fund that the E911 fees pays into? Correct. That fund currently has a $19 million uh, fund balance to it. It's a $19 million fund balance? Um, when's the last time that uh, fee was adjusted or studied? Um, don't have that in front of me. I think in, in, in its inception, which is, I believe, hasn't been 10 years yet since that fund was put in place. Yeah, I'd just like some more information about specifically when the last time that was uh, increased or studied, and then also some accounting on the fund balance, what, what, the, what the fund has been used for the past couple years. Thank you. Is that a condition on the motion, or is you, are you good to the motion? I'll trust CFO Bala will get that to me by end of the week. Yolanda, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going on vacation no more. <laughs> All right. Thank, Thank you. you both very much. Way, way to delegate. <laughs> <laughs> All right. There's a motion that's been properly seconded. Let's open the vote, please. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Uh, seven yeas, zero nays. The motion carried as item is approved on substitute. Next item is 23-01332. There is a substitute, but the caption does not change. Uh, this is an uh, ordinance by Council Member Dustin Hillis uh, as substituted by Finance Executive Committee to amend the 2023 fiscal year budget to transfer appropriated funds from the general fund to the capital finance fund in an amount not to exceed $76,938.00 for the purposes of maintaining funds for extended annual contract number listed automobiles to wit, various vans, extended warranty, and leasing options with Allen Vigil Ford Lincoln Inc. on behalf of the Municipal Court of Georgia. All contracted work shall be charged to and paid from the counts listed herein and for other purposes. I'll move to bring it forward. Second. Seconded by Hillis. Uh, let's open that vote to bring forward the substitute. The vote is open. The vote's closed. Seven yeas, zero nays. The motion carries. The substitute is before us. Um, Ms. Davis. Good afternoon, Rashida Davis, Court Administrator for the Municipal Court of Atlanta. This legislation is for us to procure vehicles. That is our uh, city employee transportation shuttle that we transport employees to the parking lot areas. Uh, right now we have a 2001 model. We've been on the wait list for about two and a half years with Allen Vigil Ford. So we are asking to put these dollars aside in the capital fund. So as soon as they're available, we can get it. <laughs> There's a motion from Westmoreland seconded by Hillis to approve on substitute. And just for the public, the substitute corrects account numbers in section one. Let's open the vote, please. The vote is open. The vote is closed. I'll close. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm, back Terry was distracting me. I'm, <laughs> seven yeas, zero nays. The motion carries. This item is approved on substitute. Thank you. Next item, 23-0-1337, an ordinance by council members Amir Faroki and Jason H. Winston authorizing a donation in an amount not to exceed $500 and zero cents to Little Five Points Alliance from the council district to... <laughs> Carry forward accountant for other purposes. Motion from Winston, seconded by Westmoreland. Let's open the vote, please. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Seven yeas, zero nays. The motion carries. The item is approved. All right, next item, 23-0-1338. There is a substitute that inserts the total in the caption and funding account details in section three. I'll read it in and bring, uh, make the motion to bring it forward. It's an ordinance by Councilmember Jason H. Winston as substituted by Finance Executive Committee to establish a retention incentive payment program for fiscal year 2024 to apply to certain city employees to amend the fiscal year 2024 general fund budget, aviation revenue fund budget, waste and wastewater revenue fund budget, solid waste services revenue fund budget, fleet services fund budget, and group insurance fund budget by transferring an amount not to exceed $6 $855,326.00 to accounts re uh, referred to herein and accounts identified by the Chief Financial Officer and for other purposes. I'll move to bring it forward. Second. Seconded by Hillis. Let's open that vote, please. The vote is open. The vote's closed. Seven yeas, zero nays. Motion carries. The item is before us. CFO Bala. 
Uh, again, thank you, uh, Council. This is a commiserate paper to the one we discussed earlier. Uh, this one is for um, all uh, city-wide employees, including aviation, watershed, grades 19 and below, to um, uh, effectuate an incentive bonus to keep those employees in place as well. Um, and again, it's the same as the other one for a one-year period of time if the employees wish to enter into that program. All right, questions for the CFO. I do have one. Um, uh, so I've seen this is coming from uncommitted fund balance in our budget, which started at seven million something. Is this just brings that down by the six million point eight? Is that correct? So, so this is coming from a uh, twenty three. This is coming from the uncommitted fund balance, not the uh, reserve balance. Yeah, two twenty four. Yeah, twenty four. Two hundred and forty million. I gotcha. All right, other questions for the CFO? Motion from Winston, seconded by Hillis. Let's open the vote, please. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Seven yeas, zero nays. Motion carries. The item is approved on substitute. All right, uh, that takes us now to resolutions. First one is 23R3762, a resolution by Council Member Marcy Collier Overstreet authorizing the mayor or his designee to execute cooperative agreement number listed, property appraisal validation services with blank on behalf of the Department of Finance for a term of blank in an amount not to exceed blank. All contracted work will be charged to and paid from the fund, department organization, and account number listed herein and for other purposes. My understanding that we're going to hold this, is that correct? Okay, all right, so there's a motion from Marcy Collier Overstreet to hold. I'll second that. Uh, let's open that vote, please. The vote is open. The vote's closed. Seven yeas, zero nays. The motion carries. The item will be held. Next item is 23R3766. There is a substitute that changes the caption and uh, adds the amounts of the refunds as well as the recipients. I'll make the uh, motion to bring it forward. It's seconded by Hillis. I'm going to read it in first. The caption is a resolution by Council Member Alex Wan is substituted by Finance Executive Committee authorizing the Chief Financial Officer to refund customers for overpayments to water and sewer accounts in an amount of $40,668.44. All funds to be charged to and paid from fund department organization and account numbers listed and for other purposes. Let's open the vote to bring it forward, please. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Six yeas, zero nays. The motion carries. The item is before us. Any questions? I'll make the motion to approve on substitute. Second. Seconded by Hillis. Let's open that vote, please. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Six yeas, zero nays. Motion carries. The item is approved on substitute. All right, so we're taking 11, 12, 13, and 14 as a block as they are all task orders. I'll read them in. Um, 23R3768, a resolution by Finance Executive Committee authorizing the mayor or his designee to issue task order number listed to pay for license fees for the Municipal Court of Atlanta water damage renovations under contract number uh, Listed job order contracting consulting services with the Gordian Group Inc. on behalf of the Department of Enterprise Asset Management in an amount not to exceed $30,244.75. All contractor work will be charged to and paid from the fund department organization and account numbers listed herein and for other purposes. Item 12, 23R3769, a resolution by Finance Executive Committee authorizing the mayor or his designee to issue task order number listed to pay for license fees for City Hall repairs and renovations under contract number listed, job order contracting consulting services with the Gordian Group, Inc. on behalf of the Department of Enterprise Asset Management in an amount not to exceed $40,128.87. All contracted work will be charged to and paid from the fund department organization and account numbers listed herein and for other purposes. Item 13 is 23R3770, a resolution by Finance Executive Committee authorizing the mayor or his designee to issue task order number listed for contract number listed, job order contracting services small with Beatty Construction for Atlanta City Hall repairs and renovation. 
behalf of the Department of Enterprise Asset Management in an amount not to exceed $859,804.39. All work to be charged to and paid from uh, accounts listed and for other purposes. And item 14, 23R3771, resolution by Finance Executive Committee authorizing the mayor or his designee to issue task order number listed with contract number listed, job order contracting services small with FH Passion SN Nielsen and Associates LLC for Municipal Court of Atlanta Water Damage Renovations uh, on behalf of the Department of Enterprise Asset Management in an amount not to exceed $658,927.00 work to be charged to and paid from accounts listed and for other purposes. Commissioner Santil. Greetings again, Chair, members of the committee, Remy Santil, Commissioner of Department of Enterprise Asset Management. Um, as read, the, the legislations are for the licensing fees for the job order contracting program and the task orders in general for the work uh, for uh, upgrade repairs to City Hall and the um, mitigation repairs to the uh, water damage from municipal court. Questions for the commissioner. Motion from Shook, seconded by Bakhtiari. Is there a question from Hillis? Thank you, Chairman Juan. Uh, commissioner Santil, just wanted to ask, I know these are uh, mostly are all well underway, but um, I don't know, this is not an issue we deal with frequently in Atlanta, but you know, this was caused by seven degree weather back in December, uh, but I think the last time before that we got down to seven degrees was like 2014, so it's not that, that far away um, so we're we also looking at how to prevent this in the future are we putting in more insulated pipes more wall insulation uh, talk to me about that yes yeah, so part of the process of the assessment when they came and remediated the problem we identified the eat the issues that were causing it uh, for the pipes to burst uh, especially one in particular for municipal court that one was because the sprinkler pipe was so high um, and the, the conditions of the, uh, the air uh, made the, the, the pipe burst. So we're adding uh, heaters in, in the proximity of these um, sprinkler lines. And as well as, as the issues here in City Hall, there, there were openings in the old tower that weren't discovered until we opened up the ceiling and saw they were actual, you were actually able to get the outside air touching, literally touching the uh, sprinkler pipe. So we remediated that. We covered up all the holes, so we're addressing those floor by floor on every floor, so make sure that that doesn't happen again in the, in the future. Thank you very much. All right, there is a motion and a second on that. Um, if there's no other questions, let's open the vote, please. The vote is open. The vote's closed. Six yeas, zero nays. Motion carries. The items are approved. Next item, 23R 3772, a resolution by Finance Executive Committee authorizing the mayor or his designee to exercise the fourth renewal option for contract number listed, Sensei PPM Beacon Software Upgrade and Professional Service for MS Project Phase 3 with Sensei Project Solutions on behalf of the Department of Atlanta Information Management, Department of Aviation, Department of Enterprise Assets Management, and the Department of Watershed Management for a one-year effective October 25, 2023 through October 24, 2024 in an amount not to exceed $55,535.00 all contracted work will be charged to and paid from the fund department organization and account number listed herein and for other purposes. Mr. Baldwin, you have the floor. Good afternoon, uh, Chairman and the rest of Council. Uh, Reginald Baldwin, Atlanta Information Management, the uh, Enterprise Project Management Office Director. Uh, the package that you're looking at, uh, Sensei, is our primary project management package for uh, our department, for DEAM, uh, the Department of Enterprise Assets Management for uh, Watershed and Aviation. This is a tool we've had for several years. Uh, it's been customized to our needs. We review new packages across the landscape yearly with our vendor and technology days, and this is the best that we have in the market right now. After this renewal, of course, we'll be looking at uh, whether other new packages have entered the market that can help us. But for right now, this is the tool that AIM uses in other departments for our needs. Any questions for the department? Mm -hmm. Motion from Shook, Second. seconded by Winston. We can open that vote, please. The vote is open. The vote's closed. Six yeas, zero nays, motion carries. The item is approved, thank you. Okay, that takes us now, or maybe it takes us to dual referred. 
Um, first item is 2301331, an ordinance by council members Dozier, Winston, Faroki, Amos, Baxiari, Juan, Norwood, Hillis, Boone, Over Collier, Overstreet, Lewis, Bond, and Westmoreland, authorizing the chief financial officer to amend the fiscal year 2024 general fund budget in the amount of $3,500,000.00 by transferring funds from the general fund uncommitted fund balance to the non-departmental general fund and for other purposes. Um, I believe we have a substitute for this, but I'm going to recognize Council Member Dozier first before we uh, make a motion to bring that forward. Mr. Dozier, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, colleagues. Uh, we do have a substitute. I support the substitute. I had a conversation with CFO and with uh, the administration, um, and I'm happy to talk a little bit about the paper after y'all finish uh, moving that, if you all so choose. Okay, I'm going to make the motion to bring it forward. Actually, it does change the caption, though. Um, I'll read in the new caption. It's the same set of sponsors as substituted by Finance Executive Committee, authorizing the Chief Financial Officer to amend the fiscal year 2024 general fund budget in the amount of $3,500,000.00 by transferring funds from the general fund uncommitted fund balance to the Affordable Housing Trust Fund and for other purposes. So um, was there a, did I, are you, did I, I made the motion. You're, back to RE seconding. Yeah, let's open the vote, please. The vote is open. The vote's closed. Seven yeas, zero nays. The motion carries. The substitute is before us. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, colleagues, I know uh, many of you and I uh, talked about this legislation uh, during uh, our uh, city council gathering last week. And uh, as I stated then, I'll state it again for the public. Essentially, uh, what we're doing is uh, transferring an additional three and a half million dollars from the general fund into uh, the housing trust fund. Uh, if you all remember Council Westmoreland's legislation from 2021, which established the housing trust fund, uh, the amount of, of money that is moved into the trust fund from the general fund phases in over time to where by, I believe, fiscal year 2025, uh, we are supposed to be moving 2% from the general fund into the housing trust fund every year over year. This year is supposed to be one and a half percent. However, uh, with what was initially budget for the housing trust fund, uh, we were looking at an $8 million allocation to get to that one and a half percent. We needed about a one, eleven and a half million dollar allocation. And this essentially accomplishes that. And the reason why I thought it was important to do this is because uh, this uh, trust fund is really one of the very few reoccurring affordable housing funding streams that we have in the city. Uh, while I appreciate the administration, the mayor, and, and everyone's efforts to uh, establish new housing opportunity bonds, so thank you, Council Member Westmoreland, for your leadership there to bring a, a, an additional $100 million to our affordable housing efforts. I appreciate the Community Foundation of Greater Atlanta's efforts to bring an additional $100 million in uh, philanthropic funding for affordable housing. Uh, once those uh, funds uh, uh, get spent, that's it. And so having a reoccurring fund is absolutely important, absolutely critical. And this is essentially saying that we are going to continue to honor a commitment that we made through ordinance in 2021 to continue to fund affordable housing efforts uh, through uh, the general fund. And so uh, I ask for your support. I know many of you are co-sponsors of this legislation, uh, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, I just want y'all to know that's why I introduced this paper. And I also just want to say thank you to the mayor and thank you to the administration for uh, being uh, so committed to this work. And thank you for working with me to make sure we can have a solution uh, to move this forward. So just um, that's, I'm happy to answer any questions if you have them, but uh, that's the genesis behind this legislation. All right, questions. I have a motion from Council Member Baxiari to approve on substitute already. I'll go ahead and take a second, and I do. Is there a second from Winston? I do have a question on this. So um, the the uh, substitute basically put some a little bit of bumper guards on this just to make sure that we are in fiscally sound position um, by the end of the second quarter or at the end of the second quarter. Correct. Um, so you want to so yeah, that? sure. Uh, uh, we Substitute, we helped uh, coordinate with the council member to draft the substitute. So if you recall on 22-00777 that established the housing trust fund, establishes it in a manner that had guardrails put in place to, to begin with, right? And, and those guardrails were put in place because when we allocate general fund dollars, they are uh, general fund dollars across the board and they compete with all our city priorities. So as inflation takes a toll, it impacts um, everything that we do at the city of Atlanta. 
and all of the great work that we do, including uh, options for affordable housing. Going into the development of the fiscal year budget, it was our recommendation because of those inflationary pressures and because the um, section in that ordinance was triggered to not fund at that same level, we went in with the um, notion of funding at $8 million. What this legislation does, it allows us to fund after the second quarter, um, halfway through the year, and at any point in time, if there is significant concern, we could raise uh, our hands and say, hey, before we do do this, we'd like you guys to have some additional thoughts and considerations. But um, uh, thank the council member, thank everybody for their thoughts around how we can be both fiscally responsible and achieve uh, the funding for affordable housing. So the, my question is along that line, I guess, is it in, incumbent upon us, maybe we just need to make a note of that, Ms. Lindo, is that the, at the end of the second qu quarter that we just automatically check back with finance to make sure that we've met the condition and that the funds are proceeding. Um, yeah. Make sure we have an opportunity if for some reason there was not a decision was made that we were not fiscally able to um, that we'd at least have the dialogue at some at some point yeah so th what this does is automatically puts it in place okay. unless i need to come back and speak gotcha. to you guys so the onus is on the cfo gotcha. to come back okay. and raise a stink about it okay that's good all right any other questions um, all right, uh, we, it's been, there's a motion properly seconded by Bakhtiari and then Winston. Uh, let's open that vote, please. The vote is open. The vote's closed. Seven yeas, zero nays. Motion carries. The item is approved on substitute. Councilmember Westmoreland. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, two quick comments. One, thank you, Councilmember Dozier, um, for taking the lead on this. Um, and then second, we've kind of found ourselves in the same spot two years in a row um, and as the person maybe most responsible for putting us here um, I want to say out loud that it sounds like it is worth as we end the last three days of this fiscal year with a line of sight to next June's adoption of the FY 25 budget um, having a conversation over the next 12 months about the best funding stream for an, an affordable housing trust fund because everything Councilman Dozier just said about how important it is to have liquid dollars is completely true um, and so important to this work. Um, I am certainly open to a conversation that the general fund might not be the best place for these dollars to come from um, and we've got 12 months to figure it out. So let's talk about it sooner rather than later. Um, and if there's a better stream that gets us to the goal um, which is funding as many units at 50% of AMI and below as possible, then let's take a crack at that in between now and next summer. Other questions or comments? Seeing thank you, time. colleagues. Thank, thank you, Council Member Dozier. All right. Uh, the next item is 2301334. This is an ordinance by Council Member. Okay, we do have a substitute. Did we, didn't we substitute this? Oh, no, we do, we're going to substitute it again. I hear, okay. Uh, I'll, it, the <laughs> caption is changed. <laughs> and I will um, read it in, and then we'll, it came out of transportation favorable on condition, and the substitute's going to meet that condition. But it's an ordinance by council members Hillis, Winston, Faroki, Collier Overstreet, uh, Westmoreland, Amos, Dozier, Norwood, Boone, Lewis, Bakhtiari, Waits, Bond, Juan, and Shook as substituted by Finance Executive Committee, adding to anticipations and appropriations, 2015 Series A and B General Obligation Public Improvement Infrastructure Bond Interest Income Proceeds in an amount not to exceed $9 million and zero cents to the funds and accounts listed herein to transfer from the uncommitted fund balance an amount not to exceed $3 million and zero cents to the account listed herein to address resurfacing and safety improvements in the city's right-of-way and for other purposes. I'll move to bring the substitute forward. Second. Seconded by Hillis. Let's open the vote, please. Juan and Hillis. Juan and Hillis. The vote is open. The vote's closed. Seven yeas, zero nays. Motion carries. The substitute is before us. 
Mr. Hills, would you like to speak to this first? <clears throat> Thank you. I gave my extended version of speech in the uh, Transportation Committee, so I'll just uh, say um, thank you to law, uh, thank you to finance, Deputy Chief of Staff Pace, and all other 14 members of council who signed on to this. Uh, this is going to get us back to where we needed to be uh, since we uh, did not resurface any streets for roughly two years under the prior administration. Um, so $1 million for each council district. Uh, I promised in uh, transportation that I would work with my colleagues if you need any assistance in getting us lists and uh, before you meet with uh, transportation. Uh, and there is a stipulation in here. We want to have all of this picked out and shored up by the end of September uh, so we can let these contracts uh, out to bid. So I will make a motion to approve as substituted. All right. A sec uh, motion by Hill is seconded by Baxiari. I have a form question on this one. It says not to exceed $9 million. However, we are contemplating that if there is additional interest proceeds that we're actually going to exceed that $9 million and then deduct from the $3 million, right? So how does that work? Mike, microphone. We are allocating the $9 million now from the account. As the account accrues more interest, we'll have to come back with a separate paper. It'll just take a second piece of action yeah. to basically shift that money over and then reduce the uncommitted fund balance. Correct. Okay. All right. Uh, with that, there's a motion and a proper second. Let's open the vote, please. The vote is open. The vote's closed. Seven yeas, zero nays. The motion carries. The item is approved on substitute. And I do want to thank Councilmember Hillis for his leadership on this issue. I think it'll go a long way to uh, improving and maintaining the quality of life in our city. Um, all right. Next item is 23R3756. It's a resolution by Council Members Lillian, uh, Bakhtiari, Winston, Faroki, Amos, Dozier, Juan, Norwood, Hillis, Boone, Collier, Overstreet, Lewis, Bond, and Westmoreland, urging the City of Atlanta to collaborate with Metro Atlanta counties and their health departments to support access to abortion health services and for other purposes. This came out favorable from CDHS. Council Member Bakhtiari, would you like to talk, speak to this? Yes, um, so as folks may or may not know, we were the first city to create a reproductive justice fund, an abortion fund last year uh, in response to the overturning of Roe v. Wade. We want to continue that fund this year. Um, this is also, this is stating that intention, but also the purpose of this is to also encourage our partners to join us. We need county commissions to do this. You have health departments. We need you to join us in funding these initiatives. This is this should be a collaborative effort amongst all municipalities in the Mitchell area and commissions, both Fulton and DeKalb. Please join in. Um, it is essential that we provide access to reproductive health care because we know that banning abortion doesn't stop abortion and stops access to safe abortions. Um, and as we know, this crisis has grown even more so. And I also I want to thank CFO Bala and his team for working with me on this, all my colleagues who signed on. Um, and. Uh, don't worry, Councilmember Shook, you can amend the legislation, add your name if you need to. And I also want to say thank you to Desiree and to Amplify the Reproductive Justice Coalition for all of your work on this. So motion and move to approve. A motion from uh, Baxiari, seconded by, by Hillis. Um, I, I just want to make a comment on this one. I mean, I know that it says that we're going to send this resolution to uh, our uh, companion county. Um, CEOs. I would also say that on our individual bat, we, we don't need to change the legislation, but there's all, there are also cities that are located within these counties that have the option and opportunity to do the same thing, much like City of Atlanta is in Fulton County, and we're um, acting in addition to hopefully the, the county. But um, I just want to make that observation. It gives you more people to go talk to, right? <laughs> uh, Mr. Chair. Right. With that, there is a motion that's been, yes. I also want to state for the record, as we know that with session coming, there are increased attacks and threats about banning access to contraceptives as well. So um, this is, I encourage everyone to look into nonprofits like ARC Southeast, uh, as well as um, some of the other uh, nonprofits in the area, especially black female-led nonprofits. They do the most work. So please, please, please educate yourselves and give your dollars to them. All right, there's a motion that's been properly seconded. If there's no further discussion, let's open the vote, please. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Seven yeas, zero nays. Motion carries. This item is approved. All right, that's all the dual referred. It takes us to papers held, and I don't believe any are coming off. 
So with that, I believe we're done with our legislative items. That's um, correct, Mr. Chair. Do you have an announcement? Just a reminder to everyone that the city offices will be closed on Monday and Tuesday in observance of the Tuesday, July 4th Independence Holiday. Our council meeting uh, that was originally scheduled for Monday, including the committee chairs, committee on council, and full council meeting have now been shifted over to Wednesday, July 5th at their regularly scheduled times, 9, 30, 11, and 1 p.m. Um, the other thing I want to do... Yes, celebrate Jason Dozier's birthday on the 5th. Hopefully someone will bring cupcakes. Um, I forgot to do this in transportation, but I did want to congratulate the Atlanta Beltline for their $25 million grant award um, from the federal government for the Northeast uh, Beltline Trail. Uh, it's a huge win that finally connects the Beltline to a MARTA station, um, and it, it's in um, District 6 and 7. So very uh, proud of that accomplishment. Any other comments or announcements for the good of the order? All right, if not, we stand adjourned. Thank you.